Question 13. Transformation of graphs. So what does it say? Make a copy of this diagram. I've done that anyway. And on it, sketch the graph of this. y equals 2 minus f of x. Now, if you're doing it numerically, just altering these uh, coordinates, what that says is the horizontal position doesn't change because there's no alteration inside. The alterations take place outside. And what it says is the new y coordinate is 2 minus the old y coordinate. So you could move the points just that way. So that point at the origin, if you wanted to move that one, would simply be that point would stay there, but the new y coordinate would be 2 minus the old one, would be 2, 0. 2 take away 0 is 2, rather. So it would be at 0, 2. This one here, its position would stay at A, but instead of being at 1, it would be 2 minus 1. Oh, it's still going to be at 1. And this one here, it would still be at B, no alteration to X, but its new Y coordinate would be 2 minus its old one. So its new Y coordinate would be 2. That's doing it numerically, using the, the rule there. What is it? So it says just sketch it, showing the coordinates of turning points. So what I'll do is I'll get a copy of it, just so I can flip it about, so that I have that, more or less. Then you have to do what? Now, negative means turn it upside down. I just marked where the origin was as well. It's obvious where the turning points were. Turn it upside down. And then that two's that negative's got nothing to do with two, that belongs to that F. That two means there's an additional two. So the whole thing is going to move up two. Well if that's one above and one below, that means that point's going to move up, whoops, that's unfortunate, to there. So a new graph's going to look like this. Let's put that in a different colour if I can remember it quickly. So it's going to come down like that, go up and then come down. So the new turning points would be here. So that would be, so B would be at, B along still, but then that would be up at 2, because the whole thing shifted 2. Turning upside down kept it where it was. Turning it upside down kept it there, and then it was shifted up 2. Turning this upside down put that two below where it was to begin with, then shifting two, put it back up there. I didn't think they were that point. They just say the coordinates of the turning points. So that's definitely the first bit, isn't it? Sketch the graph of that, so I'll just put its name in. Y equals two minus F of X. B, on a separate diagram. Yeah. Draw the graph of the derivative. I'll we'll just put it underneath. So the graph of the derivative of this one, this is a case of what's it doing? The graph of the derivative means that you'll be plotting the values of the gradient. It's nothing to do with the original y coordinates, whether they're above and below. Now the gradient was zero here at A, and the gradient was zero at B. Before it got to A, the gradients were positive, positive amounts. So it must pass through this region. After they left A, they were all negative amounts. So the values would be down here somewhere. And then after they left B, they became positive amounts again. So all I need to do for this one is put something through those regions. So it'll be something like this. So that would be the graph of Y equals F dashed of X, which is what you'd expect, because that's a cubic curve. That looks like Y equals X cubed plus the rest. The derivative of that should just be a parabola, Y equals X squared. Now there's a part C, isn't there? Part C. The tangent to y equals f of x at the origin, <coughs> that's y equals, it says the tangent here, the tangent to y equals f of x at the origin has got this equation. y equals a half x. Well, that means the gradient there's a half. That means the gradient is a half. And the gradient is the same as the value of the derivative. So it says use information to fix a value in this. Well, even though the scale doesn't look right, that must mean that that's the point zero, a half. Because when x is zero, the value of the gradient is a half. And that's question 13. Question 14. Differentiate this with respect to x. Well, there isn't anything else there. Well, the first thing is, you have to get it in a suitable form. So as far as our course is concerned, you don't know how to do products or need separate terms, and you don't want roots or denominators, you want an index form. So the first thing I'll do, I'll rewrite that in an appropriate form. I'll put that back into an index, 
and then I'll multiply it out. So 2 times x to the half times x, which of course is power 1, multiplying the terms, add the powers, would be 2x to the 3 upon 2, 2 twos are 4 for the coefficients, and that's just x to the half again. And then I need to differentiate it, and then you think, now how do I write that down? Because there was no name, you could invent a name, but you could simply do this. So what you've got is this, you're wanting to differentiate that expression. So that says, I'm about to differentiate it. So it's multiplied by the power, 3 upon 2 times 2, we'll spell it out, 3 upon 2 times 2, x, take 1 off the power, 3 halves take away 1, take away 2 halves, plus multiply by the power, don't think I'll use that, I'll just use my dots there instead, because I've got x's lying around, take 1 off the power, negative a half. So altogether that's going to become 3, the 2's cancelling, x to the half, plus a half of that, 2x to the negative a half. And that may well do, but I prefer to put things back the way I found them. Whether or not that attracts any of the marks or not, I don't really know. But that certainly didn't have any indices in it, so I'm going to rewrite that. That half means 3 root x, and that negative a half means the root x is underneath, plus 2 over root x. I'm going to write it back that way. Someone has to maintain standards. And that's that question. Question 15. Now, what's it? There's part of a sine curve shown here. I can see there's this area shaded here. That's part B says find that shaded area. Ah, because that's actually quite easy. <coughs> Such a simple known result like the 3, 4, 5 triangles and so on. The standard area with sine and cos curve says each of these quarters for the standard curve has got an area of one square unit. So if I had a formula y equals 3 sine x, that would be 3 square units. Or if I had sine 2x, would it squashed up by half, it'd be half a square unit. So I know that straight away that answers a half a square unit. But I don't think we'll get away with that, I think we to derive it. The other thing is this, there's no mention of degree signs anywhere here, this is all in radians. So even though it doesn't mention that, when it's asking for the values of p and q, they'll have to be in radians. We need to be in radians anyway, to carry out an integration. Right, so 5a, what does it say? Write down the values of p and q. Well, this is a squashed up one, sine 2x. Instead of going all the way to 2 pi, no, which is the French, all the way to 2 pi, it's only going to go as far as pi, it's been squashed up by a half. So that would have happened at pi, so it's now happening at pi up in 2. So p is equal to pi up in 2. q would have happened at 3 pi up in 2. That's 270 back in the lowlands. But in radians, that's 3 pi up in 2, which squashed up will be 3 pi up in 4. So those are the two values. Next part, let's combine those. That's a mark each. No, it's not. It's one mark for both of them. Oh, that's a bit unfortunate because you don't get half marks. B. Find the area of that part there, so I'm going to integrate it. So I'm going to integrate it from where it starts to where it finishes. I'm going to integrate it from pi up in 2 to 3 pi up in 4, even though I know the answer is a half. Of sine 2x, which I'll emphasise as a function of a function. Right, well the first part would be this. Sine goes back, came from cos, but cos gave a negative sign, so this is going to come back to a negative cos. So I've got negative cos of 2x, but it wasn't just sine of x, it was sine of 2x as a linear function in there. If I was differentiating, I would have multiplied by 2, the derivative of the inner function. Integrating is the opposite, I'll divide by 2, so I'll make that negative a half cos 2x, which I then evaluate from pi upon 2, to 3 pi upon 4. Right, so putting those figures in. One thing I will do is this. I'll take that negative a half out because it's going to appear both times. So that's going to be a common factor. So I've got the cos of 2 times that. I've got the cos of, well I'll just put it down, 2 times 3 pi upon 4 minus the cos of, whoops, 2 times pi upon 2. So that's negative a half of the cos of 3 pi upon 2 minus the cos of pi. And then just think of the cosine curve. <coughs> 
to find these to find these values. That's pi up in two, pi, three up in three pi up in two. Well, three pi up in two is zero. Pi is negative one, so it's minus negative one. So what I've got then is negative a half times one, which is negative a half. Now that's what the integral gives you, but it's asking for the area. And when, it, when you're interpreting an area, you take it as the actual amount, the positive amount. So I'd finish off by saying, which means that the area itself will be a half, which we knew anyway, a square unit. That's question 15. Question 16. Given this function, find the value of the derivative of it for a certain value of x. First thing is, it's a function of a function. If it was just something squared, it'd be 2 times the thing, and that'd be it. x squared, 2x. But there's an inner function. <coughs> so, general. So for the derivative of that, it would be just 2 times the thing to the power 1. But inside it, lurking like a Russian doll, is a sine x plus 1. So you multiply the derivative by the derivative of that inner part, and sine goes to cos. And plus 1 as a constant disappears. So the value is just going to be 2 cos x times sine x plus 1. And then evaluate it at pi upon 6. So pi upon 6, that's 30 degrees. If you don't remember it, remember your 30-60 <coughs> triangle. Don't know why I've put the 60 at the bottom, but I've done it now. So that's 2 for the longer side. The shortest side is opposite the shortest angle. That's the 1, and that's the root 3. So 2 cos. Cos of 30, the adjacent side, that's root 3 upon 2. Sine of 30, that's the opposite side, the side without the angle. That's a half, plus 1. So that gives me root 3 times 1.5. That's root 3 times 3 upon 2. Or you could just say 3 root 3 upon 2. And there you go. Three marks fairly quickly. Question 17. A balsam inverted upwards. Here's the formula for the height after a certain number of seconds. And part A says, what's its speed? Ah, speed. Speed is distance over time. The instantaneous speed will be the rate of change of distance. Differentiate it. So that'll be 19.6 minus 2 times that, 9.8t. Oh, and straight away, look, that's half of that. That'll make it easy. So what's the speed at t equals 1? Well, if t equals 1, and I'll just write speed out properly, the speed will be 19.6 taken by 9.8 times 1. Well, that's one of the halves of that, so the answer must be the other half. And the units were seconds in metres, so speed, so metres per second. <coughs> <coughs> Unless you want to do the B, M S to the negative 1. <coughs> B. For how many seconds was the ball travelling upwards? Well, it's going to travel up until it stops, and then it'll fall back down again. So it'll be travelling up until the speed's zero, and then it'll come back down. So, speed equals zero means that... 19.6 minus 9.8t will have to equal 0. So that, taking that the other way around, 9.8t will be 19.6, t will be 19.6, you know the answer already, divided by t, whoops, put that back in there, because that was half of that, so it's going to be 2. 2 seconds. Unless you want to finish with a little sentence. How many seconds is it travelling upwards? It will travel up for 2 seconds, and then come to rest. I'll just leave it like that. So, question 18. Write this equation in terms of cos theta. Well, as soon as you get a equation like that, you realise <coughs> it's a double angle equation. There's two different mentions of theta, so it's not just a case of moving things from side to side. I'll need to rearrange this one. Cos 2 theta becomes 2 cos squared theta minus 1, plus the 8 cos theta and the 9, they just stay there. And tidy that up. 2 cos squared theta plus the 8 cos theta, that won't change, 1 of the 9, 8. Then the question said, show it's got equal roots. Well, you could just take that quadratic, get its discriminant. If the discriminant's 0, it's got equal roots. But you want to go on and find something to do with those answers. So I'll just go ahead and show that you get two answers which are the same. So I'll just divide everything by 2. 
So I've got cos squared theta plus 4 cos theta plus 4 is 0. Factorise it. It's a quadratic. I've got some variable. And then the square of that and a constant at the end. So that will be cos theta times cos theta. 4. That will be 2 times 2 to give a 4 in the middle. Everything's positive, and there, everything's the same. I'll have to demonstrate it. So I'll just demonstrate it by writing out the two answers. So cos theta equals negative 2, or negative 2. In other words, negative 2 twice, i.e. 2 equal roots. <coughs> B. Show sure, it's got no real roots. Oh, that's easy. Cos theta equals negative 2 has no, what was the wording, no real roots as the cosine of theta has to be less than or equal to 1. I just used those absolute value signs, but you could write less than or equal to 1, but greater than or equal to negative 1. The cosine graph looks like this. The highest it gets to is 1, the lowest it gets to <coughs> is negative 1. You'll never get an angle that'll take you down to negative 2 if it's only cos theta that you've got. It's got no real roots, as that's the case, and that's equal to negative 2. That's question 18. Last question. <coughs> Little log question. Now, if you had a calculator that had log base 5 on it, which you do have nowadays, you can just type that in, and there's your answer. And even though this paper was paper 1 in the 1990s, paper 1 was a calculator paper as well. But I'm just going to proceed with that as if you only had log base 10 or E on your calculators. So the first thing would be, it may well be, <coughs> although I know it's not, that you don't need a calculator. Because when you combine those logs, you could have something nice here, some power of 5. You know, that if you're adding two logs, then that's equal to the log of the, the single log of the product. It's the log of 3 times 4. So that's the same as log base 5 of 12. And that's no use. We don't know that. If it had been log base 5 of 25, that would have been 2. Log means log base 5 means, the operator log base 5 means what power of 5 gives this number? I don't know what it is. So, best thing to do there is just come out of log 5 territory. So the inverse of that would be 5 to the power. The inverse of the log is the exponential. So 5 to the x is 12. And then go into the land of a log we know like 10 or E, go to log base 10. So take log base 10 of both sides. <coughs> Handy thing is, log of this expression, that power can pop out. Apply a log and you can extract the power. Equals log base 10 of 12. And then to get x, just divide that out. Log base 10 of 12 over log <coughs> base 10 of 5. Now you used to have that in the higher. It's called the change of base formula. If you've got the log, the, a number in a log that you don't know, you can change it to a log that you do know just by going from there to there. You can see the connection between the two. What's happened? I didn't like log 5, so I made it log 10. But it had to be connected as a factor, divided by, look there it is, log 10, the same thing, of the old base. It used to be a formula that way. I would say something like this. It would go, oh dear, if I've got log base A of some number and I didn't like it, well, I could change it to log base B of the number if that was more convenient to me, as long as I divided it by log base B, notice how they're the same, of the original one A. That was the change of log base formula that used to be there. We don't really need to learn it because it just sorts itself out when you go through that process. In that part, of course, you just press the buttons. So it's going to be the log 12 divided by the log of 5, I wanted to run a bit in advance here, which comes out as 1.5439, etc. Or we could just say 1.5, I don't know if it's got any significant figures in it, it doesn't actually say. 1.54, we'll just say. 